Well, ladies and gentlemen, the following is an action-packed, dense coaching session on how to master big blind play after you flatten open. If you don't want to stick about for it, you don't have to. I'm going to give you the 10 second magic secret about big blind play right here, right now. If you like the magic secret, press the like button, leave me a comment saying that you like the magic secret and subscribe to the channel. And then you can just go on your merry way. You don't have to watch the video. So here goes. People see about the flop and then they fold. If they see about the flop, you raise them. If they call your raise, you be 112 the turn. That means betting 112% pot on the turn. No less, no more. It'll make you grow massive biceps and you'll get all of the monies. Press the like button if you like the magic secret. And if you want to stick about for the full video, then you can. If not, bye for now. I think the big blind, Jess, is one of these positions where people make shit tons of mistakes every day and they have no idea that they're doing it. I think the most general mistakes in the big blind are that people are too passive, too tight, don't raise enough, don't fight enough for pots. It's another one of these red line declining kind of spots. Today, we're going to learn how to be a big blind boss. This was what you requested. Let's see what leaks you have. So how do you feel things have been going since last session and how do you feel your play in the big blind is in general? I think in general, I don't think I have too many leaks. I reckon kind of I'm doing all right, but I can definitely improve. Like I could probably improve everywhere, I suppose. And in general, kind of, I think I've been playing all right. My results haven't been great the past week, I don't think. If I was to look at them, I'm still not looking at them. But like... I feel like I'm running a bit bad, but I'm playing well and I'm not letting it really affect my game when I am running bad. I think I'm doing all right. That's all you can do. Having that conviction to say things aren't going my way, but I'm happy with my play is a really liberating thing. It's really hard to do that as a human, actually, because as much as we know that results aren't immediate feedback, because we're conditioned through life to take immediate feedback on board and to say, oh, something bad happened, so let me investigate my action that led to that. We do that with results all the time. We can't help it. We've talked about this before, but I'm glad to see that you're still confident in your play. You had a look at your results and it's a horrendous downswing. You've lost like three times what you'd won already. So, you know, really bad times. <laughs> I haven't really, haven't looked at them. Let's see what happens here then. And I don't want us to look. I don't want us to look for like another month or two. I think we'll keep going with that trajectory of just like moving away from the results as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. So famous last words, but let's see if we can get through a few more hands this week. Yes. Over to you. So on this board, <laughs> it's paired and they've bet like a third, kind of just a range bet. So on this board, sometimes I maybe wouldn't mind like a check raise because it kind of like shuts down their non Jack X. It's going to make kind of, I don't know, kind of queen king, ace king, better hands than ours, like nine queen or I don't know, like just better hands than ours are going to have to make folds here. I yep. think this is kind of the ideas around the check raise. I think I remember this hand, actually. You say that so, with yeah. a, a... I detect a, a pinch of dread in <laughs> the way you talk about that. <laughs> well, I think I agree that people are range betting and, you know, fuck them. Because, like, they don't get to just range bet and get away with it because we're not going to be like the rest of Pool Jess. We're not going to roll over and be like, oh, no, you range bet, let me fold more than the solver would fold to a non-range bet. Because a lot of people are doing that. They're moving the opposite direction in their exploits, right? Like, people are range betting and they are folding more in the big blind than the solver would fold against the non-range bet, like against whatever that would be. This is a board that probably just gets range bet anyway, so it's not a very good example in GTO, the solver bets here, but... I think this is a race candidate. We have blockers to Jack Nine of Clubs. We have blockers to King Jack suited in offsuit. Yep. We have Rappy, Backdoor, Gutter, Flush, etc. This isn't one of our check raises. What is? I would pure raise because, like, screw them. I'm not accepting their ability to take pots from me. I'm not having it. And nor should you, Jess. You should not be okay with these cretins trying to take pots from you. Don't allow it. Much love to anyone that plays in this pool, by the way. Really glad you guys are here and sorry <laughs> for calling you cretins. So we raised to eight, which is, I kind of like the sizing as well, because what you're really saying here is like, well, I have a jack, and if you don't believe me, that's too bad. I'm going to keep telling you I have a jack on lots of turn cards, and I'm not going to raise anything smaller because I'm not raising pocket eights here or something. So I like the sizing. I think against button, you can start to build in some pocket pair into your raise as well and actually make it a little bit smaller if you want to. But against early position, I'm a big fan of like a big bulbous check raise. Like I think it's the right way to go with your sizing because you are repping a polar range there. Yeah. I think we 
probably need to just give up this hand on this turn. We're in a disadvantageous world now with being called. We don't have two over cards to all pocket pairs, like tens, for example. We don't have two overs to. We block backdoor flush draws. We don't have a gutter. I think my follow throughs here would be like ace five, six five, king queen. If that makes sense, like I'd be a bit fussier, theoretically. If you want yeah. to go down the whole, they're going to overfold their non jack x region and just go like bomb blast. I get where you're coming from, but I disagree in this spot. I don't actually think this is like a massively overfolded node anymore. They do have a lot of jack to start with, and I'm not, I don't trust the 25 and LGG pool to fold like queens plus a large frequency here. Sometimes they will. So I think you have to give up your a la Crow's rule in the Carrot Poker School, which is a bizarrely named rule. I don't know why it's named after a crow. But the idea is that when you check raise the flop and the turn is bad for your hand and your hand is one of the worst hands in your range, you usually have to give up the turn there theoretically. That's Crow's rule. It basically says don't lose your shit on bad turns for your hand after you've check raised the flop. Right. So this bet, <laughs> bit iffy. I would say this is a bit iffy. There's a time and a place to seek fold equity in this game and we will be working on this a lot. We're going to blast people off of their whole range in some spots. We're going to overbet all in for Forex pot and whoever is a bluff. We're going to do all kinds of shit. But this is where I think this is not an overfolded node and this is not the right hand for the job. And it's just going to be a give up for me, this one. And I think River as well, probably a similar thing where this unfortunately just doesn't get enough fold equity now on this node. This is too much filtering. I mean, yes, yeah, sometimes you'll get them off like kings. Like sometimes they'll get to this point and they'll be like, okay, I call twice. I'm not calling the third one, but. Problem is, one, whales kind of make up their mind, usually on the turn here, if this is a whalish player. And then there's just a lot of jack x in this range, right? If you go combo counting here, while there's going to be some overpair combos, there'll also be just be a shit ton of trips combos, which are basically never going anywhere. If you are going to bet the river, you should jam, probably, because that's what your boats and good jack x would want to do. So probably jam is the theoretical play here that your value range wants. Yeah. But yeah, I don't like turning river here. Yep. So a bit unselective there with the bluffs, and I don't want to dissuade you from bluffing because I love that you have the heart to bluff here. I absolutely love it. The problem is you're attacking an early position range that just filtered by bet calling flop and calling turn in a pool where fold equity at this juncture is not so good. There are spots when fold equity is amazing. This ain't one of them. Yeah. Any thoughts or questions or things you want to say to past Jess there? No, that, yeah, that was kind of what I thought at the end of the hand, I think. When I did get raised here, I thought, God damn, he's filtered so hard, like calling the check raise, calling another big turn, but like, what am I doing? So I think I come to the same conclusions after, but I wish I'd thought a bit more about the turn mm -hmm. and not just kind of got carried away because if I shut down the turn, I'm just shutting down. Like this, this just doesn't happen if I don't bet the turn. And there's plenty of reasons to not bet the turn, like you were saying. Yeah. It's all about just recognizing like, where are the spots where I'm going to steal something Jalderman told me, you know, Jalderman. Yes. That guy that's obsessed with Ruse Solver and talks about it all the time in my stream. Him. <laughs> Lovely guy. It's Jared. Shout out to Jared. But he said something that at first I was like, shut up, Jared. This is stupid. And then after I thought about it a bit more, I was like, ah, do you know what? I kind of like this. So he said, like, how much of the opponent's range will be put into a tough spot? And historically, I, I hate on the expression tough spot all the time. And I do impersonations of bad coaches that are like, um, we're going to, like, put him in a tough spot here. Um, And I, like, take the piss out of this. But... In its defense, and in Jaldeman's defense, he then went on to clarify well. He said, Pete, if lots of your opponent's range is suffering, if there's loads of anguish and horror in your opponent's range, that does just tend to correlate with a high fold frequency. And I was like, of course it does. So it's not that the tough spot is not a useful metric. It's just that putting your opponent in a tough spot, that's more of a byproduct of generating a lot of fold equity or maybe a symptom of generating a lot of fold equity. The thing that we really care about is the fold equity. Now, if you apply the Jalderman test, let's call it the Jalderman test, to this spot, yeah. shit tons of villains range is not in any kind of conundrum because it's a jack or an overpair or a bow and it's just like, I don't care, I'm calling. It's not a spot where we're putting villain that hard into the blender. Okay, they're not going to love life here with jack 10. That doesn't mean they're folding though. They're not like truly in the blender. Now, if you imagine that the turn was the nine of hearts, forget your hand for a second, Jess, right? Just look at the run out. So the turn was the nine of hearts and the river was the eight of hearts. Well, now all of your backdoor hearts and loads of your backdoor straights have got there. You have way less air in your range. Your range looks much scarier. Now it's very possible that like some overpair or trip jacks is finding a fold at high frequency and is in the blender, truly. The problem with this spot is you're not actually throwing tons of villains range into that anguish situation here. And that's why it's yeah. not worth the big massive investment. Okay. 
I'll show you some spots in another session where like I purposefully try and put people into like hideous spots that makes most of their reins cry. And that's the spots you want to be going nuts in. Okay. This is slightly loose, but I don't hate it. You could lead here, actually. You could lead here. 654 is a fantastic board for you, so I don't know how much you've dabbled with the dark art of donk betting, but this is a spot you could. <laughs> Not at all. Right. Not very much. I think I'm just being a bit stationary here because we've got like the extra person on the button. I think that's what got me to call pre. If that button folds, then I probably do as well. I think the extra money going in on the button convinced me to just throw another BB in just in case. I do remember that like your equity is lower when you have another person in the pot. So like if you hit a pair of nines, you're not going to win as often with the other person in the pot than you are heads up. Nice. It's not just that pot odds improve and there's no downside. There is a downside as well. And the hands you want to play there are hands which don't really feel the burn from the extra player being in the pot because they depend upon making monstrous hands anyway. So when you have threes... You don't really care that the other person's in the pot. Like your equity's gone down a bit. You're going to win less often with a naked pair of threes. But hey, how often are you going to win with a naked pair of threes heads up anyway? Whereas 9-8 yeah. does rely to a greater extent than threes on one pair value. And one pair value is what gets decimated by the button coming along. So no, this is not such a clear call. Got you. And that, yeah, and that makes so much sense as well. <laughs> it's like such an obvious thing, of course. <laughs> like, just because you're getting pot odds, your actual accuracy has gone down anyway, so it doesn't actually matter. It's like you go to buy a car and you're like, well, why wouldn't I buy that Jaguar for like 60k? It's the best car here. Of course I'll buy it. It's like, but it costs like five times more than like all those cars, <laughs> which are quite decent cars. So you have to think about both sides of the risk reward ratio, of course. I know that sounds obvious now. We call a flop, which I don't I don't like hate that or anything. It's gonna be close to break even now. Another thing you could do here, I probably wouldn't in this spot actually, but it's another one of these spots where if you bomb it, like they're gonna be in a world of pain quite often, but at the same time they do just have quite a lot of strength between their two ranges at this point. So mm. another thing you want to be true before you like lose your shit and start massacring people in the big line with these raises. You don't want to be attacking overly strong ranges. So like when a weaker player pots the flop at you. You don't generally want to check raise a lot of the gutters. You would check raise normally and stuff like that. This one, I think there's a bit too much just going on here in these two ranges here for your fold equity to be that good. But it's mm -hmm. definitely a spot where you could scare the hell out of people in a different situation, a different texture maybe. I think call's okay here. The implied odds of the seven are reasonable. You could probably fold the flop though. It doesn't seem like fantastic to, to peel there, to be honest. Okay. And then king on the river. Okay, so what are your thoughts here? I don't know. I think just because it's multi-way... I just thought I'd be playing a bit more honest. I didn't want to go kind of bomb in the river, even though they both check turn. They're very kind of polarized on the turn, a pair of them. They've either got like nothing at all or they're just sitting on, I don't know, like a house or something. I totally disagree they've... with this. Where are you getting that from? Already? Yeah. Where are you getting the polarized thing from? I mean, they've either got like something or they've got nothing at all. <laughs> that's true. But when something becomes all of the hands that aren't nothing, that's a tautology. Like it has to be true. Polarized means there's a big middle part of their range missing. Right. That's what polarized means. So when you say they've either got a house or they've got air, then that's polarized. But that's not true because they have this guy can have nines, tens, jacks, queens, flush draw, sevens, eights, six x, threes. This guy can have yeah. most of those hands as well, apart from the really big over pairs. This is a really merged yes. spot. Their ranges are really merged and really condensed here. So when they both check the turn, one slight issue. This player isn't actually that capped. No, th though they are both capped. They've both had a free checking opportunity, right? They could have both bet. They each had a free opportunity to bet. They both checked. They've condensed their ranges. They've capped their ranges. Now, what you're doing there is called being lost in the hand reading mist. The hand reading mist is something I'm going to talk about in another video very soon. And I showed you a horrible AI image of people playing poker in a misty forest earlier, which I'm going to use for that. And they were mutants with deformed faces and arms coming out of their heads because an AI made that picture and AIs don't understand how to depict people as non-mutants yet. They've not reached that point yet. Long story short, in that video we talk about this exploitative mist, which is the idea that when you start hand reading but you don't really give it enough thought, you're not careful enough, and you just start throwing out concepts, you fall into the habit of lazily throwing out ideas and concepts that are totally wrong. So I wonder how often you just call people's ranges polarized for no reason whatsoever and get into that lazy habit of mishand reading people. Yeah, definitely. I think it could actually be happening. You're absolutely right. I'm missing out like eights, nines, tens. We're all going to kind of take similar lines. And draws and, and, draws, and pair yeah. plus draw. You're missing out all of the mergy hands that both players have yeah. loads of here. 
So they have capped ranges. This is where the problem solving comes in. They have merged ranges. You ostensibly could have some boats and some four X and stuff here, right? You're in the big blinds. You can easily have a four. I guess you could have a set. It's a like you'd probably raise the flop with a set, I guess, but you could. You're mainly repping a four here if you go nuts. But here's the question. Mm -hmm. How do they feel, by and large here, with their range, with their mostly capped ranges? If you just pot this, let's just pick a size that's big, but not like absurd. Say you pot this or slight over a bit, B120 this. How does this guy feel? Not very happy. He's probably got some underpairs to the kings. Yeah. Big time in the blender with underpair to the king, with missed flush draw, with sevens. Maybe as a king sometimes, but I don't think so. I don't think a king C bets the flop very frequently, right? Unless it's like king X of clubs. In the blender, big time. This player capped again, pocket pair heavy, draw heavy. In the blender, big time. Yeah, you should absolutely bluff this river. This is a spot where fold equity is higher than it needs to be. If you if you bet like two X pot here, you'll probably get it through more than sixty six percent of the time. Okay. The two X pot's winning. I'm sure it is. Right. And you also unblock all best busted flush draws. You're basically saying I have no bluffing range on the river in this spot. When you have loads of 4x, you're saying that you have no bluffing range. There's no reason to have no bluffing range unless you think it's underfolded. And your only reason for it being underfolded was it's multi-weight. That doesn't mean it's necessarily underfolded. It just means that you have to think about the fact there are two people. But when both of their ranges are capped, I think this is the mandatory bluff spot. This is a great bluff spot. Okay. That's one we're missing. So let's speak to your past self. Why did you miss this? What did you do wrong? What are you going to improve? Tell me. Tell the audience. Missed this with some pretty bad hand reading. Missing out lots and lots of their range that's kind of weak and doesn't like to face a bet on this river. And just kind of playing a bit face up because it's a motorway part as well. When we still have fold equity here, even though there's two people in it. Um, because of how capped they are. Yeah. Just because there's more than one opponent, it doesn't mean that fold equity is necessarily bad. The combined enemy needs to fold 60% of the time to a 1.5x pot size bet here, which means that each enemy individually is going to have to fold about 76-77% of the time, something like that. That easily happens, I think. So, but this player still having another player to act behind, I don't think you get looked up by like jacks particularly often in this spot at all. I'm quite a fan of the bluff here on the river, for sure. Okay. All sorts of sizes could work, by the way. You could even go smaller and it could work, but... If you go third pot, it only has to work 25% of the time now. It's another thing to think right, about, right? Okay. Ace four, flat blind versus blind. You could three bet, you could flat. They check, we check. Seems okay so far. Five turn. So this is another spot where you could say, like, well, what are you doing, mate? Like, what are you up to here? You've checked twice. What does your range look like on average? And what's my fold equity like if I bet? How much of your range is going to be suffering if I decide to, like, lose my shit here for two streets and go nuts? I mean, we block, like, Flush draws with a diamond. We've also got a gut shot anyway. And they're just kind of not showing any sort of strength at all here. <laughs> so. Yeah, the only objection is we do have quite a bit of showdown value with ace four. So like I don't mind a check with a send at all. But I think if you get here with like jack 10 or something, you know, you've got two over cards, you've got a pair draw. They have a ton of ace X and king X. You could just like over bet the turn. Like just, just like what I want to encourage you to do is get creative, get fun with your bluffs in some spots. Because like when you overbet the turn, you're just saying, okay, well, actually, mate, I've got 4-7, I've got 9-7 here, I've got 5s, I've just made a, a boat, what are you going to do about it? And it's like, well, if they've capped themselves that heavily, they're not building the check raises and check calls in that the solver would, how on earth are they going to protect themselves from 2x here? Like, imagine you just 2x pot this, like, what are they going to do, like, realistically? They're just going to fold, like, 90% of their range. So there's so many spots in this pool where you can get inventive. With this hand, it might even still be good, even though it's a check in GTO and you've got showdown value here. It's probably not a bluff in GTO ace four here, I wouldn't think so. But what does GTO know? Like it thinks your opponents are going for double check raises with Atex here at decent frequency and things like that. It's it's tripping. It doesn't know what's going on in your world. This is a really cool spot as well. So this guy has just checked twice. He said, I'm I'm not interested in this spot twice. So we know that humans don't have enough combos of trips or boats or anything like that. What's he claiming to have? What's the value range that this player is claiming to have here? Value range, like four seven, possibly, even though the board's paired and stuff. Then we've got obviously kind of slow played houses. And then I don't know, kind of like Ace X that he thinks is winning at showdown. That's Maybe, not a value bet. That's a polarization. No, yeah, sorry, That's a, not a value yeah. bet. What else is a value bet? So you've gone through houses, you've gone through trips. Some weaker hands too. They don't need those hands to value bet here. What else could they value bet if they got here with it? Any six, any five, any three. To getting a bit, you're getting a bit mergy now. Well, what you're starting to do is you're starting to accuse your opponent of making a bit of a polarization error. 
Like a three on the river is not a value bet. It's not enough equity. A six, yeah, maybe. But I'm just thinking about like nines through aces. That's a lot of combos. You're missing that out. So your hand reading will get there. Don't worry, but we need to work on your hand reading repeatedly. Yeah. Over and over I again. Just, I would, yeah, I would just take those big pocket pairs out when they check twice. Like. Yeah, but you've included boats and stuff. So if you're going to include right. boats, <laughs> you should... I wouldn't include either at a high frequency. I would say it has hardly any over pairs. Hardly any boats, hardly any trips, hardly any straights. Because I think right. this pool is abysmal at checking those hands twice. Like, abysmal. I once heard a guy behind me at the football, at the Rangers game, call Rangers abysmal when they were playing badly. Not abysmal. He called them abysmal. <laughs> Thought that was the word. Shout out to you, my friend. Fun story. So in this spot, like, I just don't believe it. I don't believe the pool here. I don't believe that they're competent enough to not be over bluffing like maniacs. I don't buy it. Because, like, Start listing bluffs, Jess. Go. Start listing bluffs. And I'll tell you how many combos each one you list is. Base combos. Queen King. Yeah, 16 Queen combos. King. If they bluff. Again, be careful. Try and imagine that there's a realm of showdown value that people have towards ace high, good king high, deuces 3x, 5x. That realm is showdown value. I know people bet it because they don't know what's going on at these stakes. Sure, they could have that. I'm not disagreeing with you. But that's a hand that's verging on showdown value. So when I say bluff, go a little bit lower than that. Bit lower than King Queen. Lower than that. Mm -hmm. Jack 10? Yeah. 9 10? Yeah. So Jack 10, perfect example. 16 combinations. Okay. Diamonds and hearts will bet very often earlier. 14 combinations of hands that get here too frequently because people don't bluff enough earlier with those hands, probably. And then just decide to take a shot at the river. I can do this really quickly. Like I'm a show off. I can be like Queen 10, Queen Jack, Jack 10, Jack 9. I can list them quite quickly. King deuce, queen deuce, if they're opening that. There's quite a lot. It's quite easy to have two random cards between a sort of king and a nine here. Now, they're meant to be bluffing 27% of the time for this sizing. Only 27% of the time. Don't buy it. You're bluffing half the time, mate. At least. Maybe even 55, 60%. I think you win here more often than you lose if you call. But I think you're going to fold. You might not. You no. might surprise me. Yeah, I'm like, I think I might call. I'm not sure. Do you want to bet on it? I've no. not seen the hand. <laughs> I don't trust myself. I can't remember. I would expect a call. <laughs> you see, I just bluffed you there. So let's see if this guy bluffs you as well. <laughs> Countdown from five. <sighs> Good fold, Jess. Good fold. Not that fold. That's a bad fold. But you made a good fold in that bet where I challenged you to put money on it. <laughs> oh, God. This is a really winning call. And you know what? Sometimes you're going to call and this bozo is going to show you ace 10 and you're going to be like, what the f*** are you doing? That's a polarization error. What are you doing? That's going to happen. But man, ace 10, that's humiliating. But if they have ace 10 sometimes, just think of all the jack 9 and jack 10 and queen 10 and queen 4 and all these hands they play this way. So you're going to do fine here with a call, with yeah. a hero call. These are the spots to hero call against this pool. Mm -hmm. These are the spots. Okay. All right, ace 7. So you can say, well, what's the difference between the way you're playing and the way I'm recommending? I'm just telling you to like absolutely fight tooth and nail in these small pots with these capped people that don't protect their checking ranges. Yeah, I tooth. feel like I've been doing it all right otherwise, but I'm just having problems in the blind. The thing's out of position as well. I mean, that last one obviously wasn't, but like I hate playing out of position, as many kind of people do. Most people fold that spot. Like That's kind of a hard call to make. But when you think about it in the right way, you want to make it. But I do think you're playing better. I think you were like far too switched off in small pots before and now you are putting more thought into it for sure. But now it's time to move past the barriers of I don't want to bluff. I don't really want to call ace high. I want to look at absolute hand strength. These are barriers to like the true EV, you know? Yeah. Okay, seven, big blind versus button. Check, call, flop. Turn goes, check, bet. I think easy call. Not much to do. All right, half pot. Let's have some thoughts, Jessica. I think I fold this in the end. I felt like, you know, he's just not going to go barrel away and betting three times with any kind of worse stuff that I beat. Even his worst aces have kind of two paired at some point. Right, but you're not trying to beat value bets. This is clearly a bluff catcher, so you shouldn't be thinking about whether you beat any value. You should be thinking about how often people bluff here. That's what you beat. You beat bluffs. So how often do people bluff here? I don't think people are bluffing very often here. The half pot was a bit sus, but then it kind of is one of those spots where people, I feel, that kind of half pot is more for value. Like, that's them just trying to get a call. 
you know what I mean? They're not making it too big. They just want to eke out a bit more from you. So I didn't think this was a bluff. Because I'm in the big blind as well. Like my range kind of doesn't mind the run out. So like to be betting three times against me, I feel like they've got like a value hand for sure. Okay, so I think that's really biased. There's a few different player types here. If this is a recreational, bear in mind you only need to win 25% of the time on the river. So button versus big blind. Generally speaking, triple barrel is slightly over bluffed in these late position spots and under bluffed in early position, like from mass data. That is board dependent and it's player type dependent though, so I'm not saying you should call every triple barrel because some boards are really under bluffed and some player types just don't really bluff. I don't know if you remember who the player type was in this hand or not. No, not not likely. Yeah, so if it's a, a reg, then the big three quarters pot size turn bet, followed by the half pot river bet, is probably highly indicative of like ace king, ace queen, ace three ace five like hands like that in general like i kind of agree with that player type if it's someone that's like a recreational player though they don't necessarily think about sizing and percent pot so much and like this can be a bit overbluffed. this is a really interesting node i think all three plays are relatively close here and yeah like all three plays like i don't actually think that raising huge here is ridiculous all right okay i don't think it's ridiculous you'd be repping kind of thin you'd be saying that you have like a slow played straight or pocket eights or ace eight or something like that but raising to like 50 here if this is a weak reg is probably a really fun play this isn't really the right hand to do it in theory because you block the bet fold range which is single ace x and you block some bluffs with the seven it's probably not the hand to do it within gto but i just want to like make the point that my brain investigates that idea right like okay yeah i think they're thin value betting a lot Maybe that makes calling not so good if it's the readers, this is a weak reg. Could I just bomb it? Like, could I turn it into a bluff now instead? That's the kind of thing I want you to think about sometimes. Yeah. So I think against a recreational player, I wouldn't fold here. I just click call and because their starting range is quite wide, it's quite likely they're bluffing more than 25% of the time if they're just a random wreck or even they just show up with some absurd polarization error sometimes, like tens. If this is a reg at 25 and L, I agree the big bet followed by half pot river is probably really value heavy and then I'm kind of more on board with folding or even like turning it into a bluff sometimes and seeing if I can just put them in the blender. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with it. But be careful there against fish. There's a lot of erratic stuff going on when they have a wide range and I don't like that fold against the fish. I feel like if that was a reg, saying we don't know the villain, don't really know the villain type, but I feel like if that was a reg, I might put in a raise from the big blind when I opened on there because I wouldn't want to be out of position with my hand. We block like obviously good ace kings, good aces that are open then i would maybe say then that this villain is maybe kind of passive a bit fishy maybe a bit of like a wreck because i feel like if this was a reg looking player like with decent like attempt to steal stats like free pit pfr crack close all that sort of stuff i'd probably just stick a raise in here to try and just say shut up you've got nothing loads of time <laughs> yeah okay you should be a bit more polar normally in, in theory like a7 is very mediocre that's probably one of the suited aces that doesn't actually three bet in theory here right like, you can't be just three betting because you don't want to play out of position. You're in the big blind, and then six max limit hold them. You have to just call in the big blind a lot because of pot odds. You can't three bet stuff because you don't want to play out of position. That's not a justification for three betting. <laughs> you can three bet people if you think they're overfolding to three bets or not four betting enough. That would be a legitimate reason. But the reason of I'm out of position and you've got a wide range, that's not enough to three bet. Like, those things are true in GTO, yet GTO still calls all the time with hands like this. So you have to just sort of accept that being out of position is part of the game tree. Yes, it's less good yeah. for you than being in position, but you still have to play your role when you're out of position and fulfill it for that hand. But yeah, against the fish, I like just calling down. I think you'll see enough random stuff for a half pot that it's okay. Against the reg, it gets interesting. 2.5, go for the call. Roll flop. They bet turn. I wouldn't expect this bet very often. I think people sort of shy away from making this bet quite often here. I think you can raise like king queen here maybe some king jack i think weaker king x than that i would just call i think in practice i just call here i just don't think ace x is going to be mm, this against button though is quite a lot of weaker king x yeah i think king jack can go either way if you have a weak king you don't raise here if you have king queen i'm probably always raising here i think with king jack king 10 it's quite borderline and do either okay and then valley bet river is played for sure what do you think your equity is here when you land on this node? Because when we're value betting and picking a sizing, we need to start with equity. So give it a bash. What do you think you get here with equity wise? I reckon, I always get this wrong every time, but I reckon about 60% possibly. Yeah, so, so that would probably make your hand a check. Ah, right. Okay. 
Because when I say equity, I mean, what do you have right now? So explain to me, why can you not value bet if you have 60% equity? Because when we're cold, we end up with like way less than that. Mm Mm-hmm. On the river here, like I would bet if I think I've got like decent amount of equity, like 70 odd percent, then I'd bet like three quarter pot. And at, for me to not bet that here, then I'm obviously at the time I'm feeling like I haven't got a huge amount of equity here. So I would have gone, I'd say maybe 50, 60 percent. And that obviously then does, like you say, is better to check call maybe. OK, so before we jump to these wild conclusions, like it's better to check call. I think we need to just address the equity side of this argument. So you've said 70% equity, that's dicey for a bigger bet. Like I'd say 70%, you're kind of betting about half pot, you're betting third pot. When you go up to 75, 80, you can definitely big bet. Yeah, I think it's in the 70s somewhere, Jess. So I think this is like in between like block and B75. So I think like half pot or something here is fine. B75 seems okay because it's button. And it also seems okay exploitatively because I think people are quite bad at being polarized enough on the turn here. I think sometimes people bet an ace too often at these stakes because they're just making polarization mistakes. So realistically here, when we raise the turn against button, because button has a lot of like polarization mistake ace x in this pool and also like weaker king x, like there's loads of them. I think we can go bigger on the river, probably. We can probably go up to like B75 or something. If we're against under the gun here, I would definitely just block bet the river after this action sequence, but then I probably wouldn't raise King Jack on the turn at all. I'd probably just call, because you are reopening when you raise and you're kind of building a pot that's verging on being quite large for the strength your hand's going to have by the river. But you definitely want to value bet the river here. Checking this river is really bad, because what's going to happen if you check is that all of the made hands are just going to check back that you're beating, most of them anyway. And villain doesn't really have much air here. So why would you check call? Check calling is a line that targets air. It's a line that looks to get value from a weak range or a polarized range. But villain has the opposite. Villain has a condensed range. So again, hand reading 101, they bet call the turn. They have an uncapped merge range, I should say, but they have a sort of linearish, made hand heavy, decently strong range that has some medium hands and some good hands and some great hands, right? Something like that. Yeah. Against that, we don't check because they don't really have bluffs. Okay. They really don't have bluffs here. So you don't want to turn a value bettable hand into a check call in a spot where your opponent's hardly going to bluff. You don't want to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you want to check a river and get tricky or whatever and check call here, you'd need to think that villain was kind of polar and you had a good bluff catcher they were going to bluff off and if you checked. That's what you need to think. Because they're not going to just bet with king four here if you check or or race queen. They shouldn't. Because when you check raise the turn, why would they bet king four in the river? You've claimed to have a good king or better on the turn Why would they then bet a bad king on the river when you check? They shouldn't. Maybe they will because they're bad at poker, but they shouldn't. They really shouldn't. Yeah, I think this is a okay sizing by you. I might go a bit bigger, but it's not not terrible. But yeah, the the worrying part there is the thought about check calling. We would not want to turn a value bettable hand into a check call. But I think what happens, Jess, is that sometimes you throw out thoughts that you've thought before. So they're familiar thoughts, but they're not good thoughts. And you're recounting them like they're song lyrics. Like you're kind of, they're in your head, you've heard them before, you've said them before, and you pull them out. That doesn't make them okay. So sometimes you have to really think carefully before you sort of say stuff to yourself in game. So before you just say, maybe check call's good here, I check. You have to be like, well, why am I saying that? What's villain's range? Let's hand read. Let's, let's get involved here. Let's really think about our opponent's range a bit more in the weeks to come. That's what we need to do. Yeah, definitely. Turn that hand reading switch on and really get to the bottom of what their range is. That'll help you figure out what your equity is and what you should do in a spot like this and what you shouldn't do, which is check. Yes. I feel like sometimes I'm good at reading hands when I kind of sense weakness. And this probably just goes back to before we started coaching, like poker for me was about big bluffs and like all of those kind of poker on TV spots. But like, I always feel like my hand reading is better when I've sensed weakness and then not bluffed. Like when, I don't know, here, for example, if we've got I don't know, Jack 10 or something. And I've maybe thought, oh my God, they've pro- they've got like lots of maybe nines, tens, like they've got stuff that might fold here and then I don't fire and they check it back and they've got like eights or something daft like that. Like, I feel like that's when my hand reading is not bad. Sometimes I do sense weakness and then just don't really pounce on it, I suppose. I think that's kind of, it's a weird. Yeah, I'd like you to be a bit less sensey and a bit more like cognitive in your hand reading, if that makes sense, like a bit more descriptive. Because they're like, if they have nines, like they're not bet calling the turn, they're checking back the turn. So they don't, they don't have nines there. And if you like ask like, what has villain's line been? What have they done? And like, what kind of range or what kind of hands make sense? And you'd be a bit explicit about it for now. I think that's better. I think you got into some really bad habits early on in your poker career of just like going with what you felt, going with a familiar thought. 
and a lot of time I think it was quite detached from like what people's true ranges were and I know that's kind of like a bit of a, a jolt for you to hear maybe it's a bit of a shocking thing but I do think a lot of the way you used to think about poker had very little to do with your opponent's true range or EV in many spots. Yeah. It was often like picking out a thought that was familiar, acting based on that thought, but that thought not really explaining the EV of your decision making enough. You have to really force yourself to engage. It might be worth actually doing some hand reviews where you deliberately go through, put your opponent on a range and you send it to me. Do it as homework if you want to get better at hand reading. Send me some hands where you've done this. DM me with them. And I'll tell you what I think, but I want to see your efforts at hand reading getting better and better and better. We did this with Mark. I want to do it with you as well, because <laughs> right now there's a bit too much acting on random thoughts that aren't necessarily true. We have to work on that, I think. You do have the heart for the aggression, and I want you to have fun bluffing this week. I do want you to like be really aggressive and go after these capped ranges, but I also want you to work on hand reading so you're a bit more aware of what your opponent's range is. I think that's the thing that's, that's lacking at the moment. Yes. Okay, any f- closing statements from you today? No, just going to go and look for uh, Mark's episode where he's talking about hand reading and stuff and just rewatch it. <laughs> it's a couple like that, I think, in the season one of Losing to Cruising. But yeah, send me your attempts. I'd love to hear your written attempts at hand reading. I think it'd be super useful or like you can make a video or whatever. So do you mean like kind of go back through some hands that I've already played or like after a session where I've tried it during the hand as well? Or is it is it just kind of looking at kind of past hands that I can't really remember, if you know what I mean? I think it's much better to do hands that you've just played when they're fresh in your head. It just creates a lot more of a in-game, out-of-game neural connection, basically, that you can then use in future. The trouble with old hands is that it's just not the same thing. You don't have the same level of accountability or sentiment towards the hand as you do after you've just played it. So why not just say, if I'd normally play for an hour, I'm actually just going to play for 45 minutes and I'm going to pick a hand and I'm going to do a hand review right up. Don't be too specific. Don't be too vague. Don't be like villains ranges, king eight, king nine, king ten, king jack, ace queen. Like don't list all of the combos, but do be descriptive. Like so for example on the turn there, when you land on the river, you could say, I think my opponent's range is all king X, some ace X that's making a polarization error, maybe the odd gutter that Bet called, and then some boats. And then once you've said that, that's the right level of specificity. Now you can sort of say, Well, I think I'm doing quite well against that range, but not amazingly. And therefore, I think I can bet up to about half pop, 66% pop, and not no bigger than that. That's how you avoid checking, blunder. How you avoid overbetting, blunder. Everything apart from a medium-sized bet is a blunder on this river. Everything else, you know. So to find that, you have to hand read. Well, it's one of those kind of skills that I'm most impressed by when I'm watching streamers and, like, content creators. And they, like, you know, they pin a hand, they give a villain a very good range, and then, like, lo and behold, they turn it over. King nine, and I'm like... That's cool. I really want to know how to do that. <laughs> King Nine was in the range, but they could have had pocket aces here and like jammed over you here. That could have happened as well. So King Nine is part of the range. It's a common hand. But I wouldn't have been shocked if you'd bet here and they called with King Queen. That wouldn't have surprised me either, you know? As long as you're being kind of specific, but not like nitty gritty combo by combo, that's the right level of specificity usually. You don't want to be too vague. You don't want to be too detailed. Okay. All right, Jess, good luck with this. Looking forward to seeing your homework and we'll see you next time on From Stalling <laughs> to Walling.